So, next conversation is with Bubba Mararka. He is a managing director at DFJ, where he focuses on mobile and consumer investments. Let's give him a big round of applause to welcome here. Thank you, Bubba. Thanks, Andrew. All right, let's check the mic. Thanks, Andrew. Perfect. Look Whoa. at you. Yeah, right? Thanks, Andrew. <laughs> hey, um, so as I've been talking to people in the audience and people at the event, one of the big questions is, how do I connect with an investor and get him to support my startup? So I thought we can start out with the story of how you backed Highlight. Totally. Um, I think it's a great question, um, an area of interest, because connecting with uh, an investor has gotten significantly easier um, with the you know, blogosphere, with Twitter, with all these different access points. But it's still, uh, you know, at best, a serendipitous process, and at worst, a, a painful process. Having been on the other side of trying to raise money, uh, I recall that very, very well. So. Connecting with an investor, I think, kind of happens, uh, you know, the, the, the well-known ways uh, happen through, you know, kind of introductions to a friend, through a friend. But I think another one that really kind of, uh, in the case of Highlight, happened for us, or for me, that led to my first venture investment was uh, writing a blog post. And so I wrote a blog post that then got uh, the CEO and founder of Highlight, Paul Davidson, uh, really interested in wanting to connect with me. And it wasn't in a fundraising context, it was just, hey, I really wanted to connect with you. Um, he happened to find a mutual friend, but I've done multiple times where someone is interested in something I've written and has a thoughtful perspective, and they share it back and then it starts a conversation going. Because oftentimes, uh, the reason investors look for introductions through people they know or favor that path is we, uh, for better or worse, are overloaded with opportunities and information coming our way, and we don't have great ways to prioritize it. And so, you know, by coming in on one of two axes of relevance, either uh, topical relevance, because it's something uh, you know the investor is interested in and timely, or coming in through social relevance, um, those are really, really structural ways to connect. And then the last thing is just doing what you guys are doing here, making the time, um, prioritizing, coming to conferences and, and facilitating a certain dipity to but connect with people. Paul of Highlight read your blog post, wanted to connect with you, but instead of reaching out to you directly, he said, who do I know who also knows Bubba? I'll ask him for an introduction. That's what happened? That is exactly what happened. So okay. I don't want to underplay that part, but I think the reason um, it was so powerful was it wasn't set up in the context of fundraising. It wasn't like, hey, this is my friend and he's fundraising. It was much more, hey, here, read your blog post. It's very thoughtful. He has a bunch of thoughts. I thought you guys should connect. Gotcha. And so would you recommend someone who maybe reads one of your blog posts tomorrow and wants to connect with you instead of following up with you directly to say, who do I know who's also connected to Bubba? And then ask for that introduction. So I definitely think that probably is uh, a very straight path to get my attention or get an investor's attention. I do think having a very thoughtful perspective and reaction. Uh, I think I posted a blog, or I don't think, I posted a blog post uh, yesterday and I've had uh, three interesting conversations come from it through Twitter. And I'm meeting with one of the companies next week, I think. So I think it's really about showing thoughtfulness or uh, kind of street smarts and how to get a connection through someone you know. All right, and one of the questions that we got yesterday, I think you can answer based on the blog post that, it, that connected you with Highlight. I think the blog post was nine ways a billion dollar new mobile company might be created, right? Yep. What's one of those ways that someone who's listening here who wants to create that billion dollar mobile company can do it? <laughs> yeah, so I think one of the most interesting ways and I don't see leveraged uh, enough or, or at least as obviously to me that people are pursuing the strategy is how to think about the fact that you know, these phones that now everyone has increasingly around the world, including the big honking Android uh, contraption I have, uh, actually are mobile sensors. They're sensors that are in the real world and can do really interesting things. Um, for example? So for example, obviously the, the one that I think is really interesting is like, what if you could use every phone uh, to get a sampling of the weather? So now no longer do you have like these big complex mathematical models that are trying to predict weather. You actually have real-time data from 100,000 or a million or 10 million phones. And interestingly enough, the Samsung series of phones has everything a weather station has in it except for wind direction. It except has a, for wind direction. Yep, yep. It has a it barometer. It has a humidity sensor. I mean, it has everything. And so there's companies that are thinking about this and starting to do this. But what are other applications that where if you had... You know, you took it from the 100,000 sensors or the complex satellite imagery that may be used to, to divine a large data set, and instead you said, what could I piece out and make everyone uh, at the end point of their phone actually help me do? 
Um, and by collecting that data, what can I then do with that data in an interesting way? And obviously Waze showed a very interesting way to do that with traffic prediction and building out maps. But I think there's an unlimited number of opportunities to really think about these things as sensors in our pockets that collect data at scale. And you prefer Android to iOS. Why? So that's a, <clears throat> it's a very nuanced uh, question because I think prefer is, um, as a user, I actually see the point of both platforms. Uh, and I switch back and forth between Android phones and iPhones. Um, but what I like about Android, specifically as an investor, um, is that it is, uh, the growth rate is talked about quite heavily. You know, four out of five phones globally are built, uh, are, are shipping with an, a version of the Android operating system. In China, the Android operating system has been forked multiple times and multiple billion dollar companies have been built on top of Android. I actually think China as, an, as a microcosm, which is not so small, but it is five years ahead of the rest of the world in mobile because they, sweat, they skipped from the wireline directly to wireless. And if you see how much uh, innovation has happened on top of Android there, it really kind of draws my uh, imagination into how large of an opportunity there is to replicate either things that have happened in China uh, in other large areas or to uh, kind of innovate with uh, an idea that starts in China, but actually starting with the global perspective of it. Um, and then when you couple that with the platform functionality uh, that Android gives you access to, in some ways it's very scary, the things you can do by default as a developer on an Android phone. But more interestingly, as a creative product designer, I think the things you can do are truly magical. And unfortunately, a lot of the best minds, a lot of the focus in the startup ecosystem are focused on thinking about an app instead of iOS as opposed to an experience on a phone. And I think those are two fundamentally different things. And Android allows you to build experiences on a phone. Is there anyone in the audience who's building an Android app who has a question? I want to start off by taking a question from people whose work is most directly related to, to Bubba's passion. Or you do. Okay. While I come over to you, I, I want to ask about... No, you can stay seated if you're comfortable. Or if you're like me and prefer to stand up, do it, Bubba. Stand. All right. Um, I look slimmer standing. <laughs> Bubba, one of the things we talked about before we started is how you ended up at Facebook. It was through a flame out. What was the business that you launched, and why do you think it flamed out? Yeah, that's, um, uh, it's, it was a very big, growing moment for me. In, in 2007, I left Microsoft. I'd been there on and off for seven years since I had graduated from undergrad. And uh, I left with a very clear perspective. I grew up in the Bay Area. I'd, I'd been programming and been around computers since I was like in the fourth grade. Uh, and I knew I wanted to do a startup. I didn't actually know what doing a startup meant, though. Um, and so uh, while I understood the idea of delivering and building software, I didn't actually know how to build a business. And um, that became painfully obvious to me about a year into it when I would uh, spent a bunch of time working through three different ideas uh, with the co-founder. You know, the first idea was an SMS gaming platform. So this was before the iPhone launch, right? So how, or right when the iPhone launched and they didn't have a platform, could you play games in SMS? I then, uh, you know, that, when we shipped it, got very poor conversions. We couldn't attract users. We couldn't attract engaged users. So we switched off of that, right? We pivoted. We, but we went into something that was completely foreign. Uh, we tried to build an, uh, a local advertising product. So something that would help brand, local shops get onto Facebook and Twitter. At the time, they just didn't know what that was. I didn't know when I started working on the problem that it was actually a sales and marketing challenge. And this was one of my first ex experiences of learning all the stuff I didn't know, the value of sales and marketing, the, the, the skill set that's required to succeed uh, at building, positioning, launching, and selling a product. Um, and so after getting my butt kicked on that problem for a while, I switched back over to something near and dear to my heart, which was a consumer search product. I'd worked on Bing for many years, and so I wanted to build a, a toolbar, a browser add-on, really, that spray-painted your social data across every website you went to. So it would connect to Facebook. The Facebook platform had been matured up at that point. And uh, it was basically uh, a really interesting way to provide context. Then Facebook launched Facebook Connect. And I was like, oh crap, okay, this is a much better approach. Um, along this whole process, I was continuously, you know, kind of going through the ups and downs. You know, I'm very sympathetic to the challenges. Uh, you know, starting a company is an unnatural act, right? It takes unnatural dedication, unnatural perseverance, unnatural um, sleep patterns, um, pretty much anything unnatural after it works for the context of starting a startup. And uh, that, that experience was really formative for me and I realized I needed to learn. 
Um, so even though I told everyone in the world, everyone in my network, I, I had went without a salary for a year, I had asked people for money and gotten a lot of no's, uh, the yeses I got were very scary yeses. Um, what do you mean scary? Oh, just I did, they were from people I didn't know or trust or they weren't on good terms. You know, gotcha. they were just things that, or they were asking me to commit to things I didn't personally believe in. Like? Right? Um, like a specific direction of monetizing the Ooh. business. You know, like if you build a browser add-on, there's very specific ways you can monetize, which frankly violate user trust. And so you have to kind of balance and understand you are represented by the business you build and really project forward on what you want to, to, to build and put into the world as an extension of yourself. Because when you start a company, it really becomes an extension of yourself. Um, and so I, uh, I folded the, the cards and I, uh, and I decided to go to an opportunity to learn something was my primary goal. I, I realized it went like, a little long. But did you feel like a failure? What? Did you feel like a failure? I, I felt like a you total, did. I felt very, very much like a failure. I felt like I'd spent a year of my life doing, with nothing to show for it. I felt like I had um, kind of squandered all of the trust and respect I had earned from all, for my network you know, and believing in me and all the congratulatory notes, um, you know, when I decided to quit and follow my dreams. And um, I also felt like I hadn't learned the thing that had made me not succeed. And so I took about two months just to kind of recover from that, frankly, and, you know, kind of doing a lot of things, getting back in shape, getting um, kind of more balanced and centered and connected with my friends. And then I um, found an opportunity at Facebook where it was there to learn business development, to learn the business side of the house. And so what was a huge uh, weight on my shoulders, and at the time a lot of people were like, oh, you're going to go to a big company now? It was 100 million users, 400 or 500 people. Like you were trying to start a startup, why don't you join something small? And I said, I need to learn. And the failure gave me humbleness in a way that made me realize I didn't know everything. I was unique, but not necessarily special. Right? And that's a very subtle nuance, but the unique means you're going to experience and have all the challenges uh, everyone else does, but uniquely versus special somehow connotes that you're gonna be able to avoid a set of them. You're never gonna be able to avoid the, anything really in life, you'll just uniquely experience it. And so, you worked on mobile at Facebook, what's one thing that you learned from that experience? And I'm sorry, I know I, know I promised to take your question, I will in a moment. What's one thing that, having worked for such an impressive company that you learned? Um, you know, I think the thing I learned most was don't be afraid. Don't Move be fast afraid. and break things, right? Like you can always fix a mistake. You cannot fix non-action. So uh, there was times when I got asked to do things that I couldn't believe I was being asked to do. Um, examples would be like, hey, we got to break into Brazil. Orcut's kicking our butt. Can you fly down there and figure it out? Uh, sure. Oh, Mark's going to come down with you uh, two days after you get there, have it figured out. Right? And it's like, oh, OK. Or hey, we don't want the Microsoft ads on our site anymore. Can you, get, can you convince Microsoft to take them off? Uh, I haven't done BD before, and that's like worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Okay, I'll try. And, and it happened. And it happened. It happened. All those things happened. All right, let's take that question. Uh, when, I, when I put the mic in, in your face, which I will, can you say your name first so that uh, we can all get to know you? I'm Shane. Uh, my question is, um, from just personal observation, it seems like most startups start by developing on iOS first. Why do you think that is when the market share for Android is just so much greater? Yeah, so I think it's probably a gross uh, generalization to say everyone starts on iOS. Um, I think specifically in the Bay Area, that is very true. I think uh, you're starting to see a series of companies globally and, um, and even in the Bay Area focus and build on Android first. And I actually think that the, the, the decision on which platform to start on really uh, is, is probably one of the most strategic decisions a startup can make because uh, besides the capabilities of the actual platforms and the functionality you can tap into, you actually have a different development process that you can do on Android. You can release an update to your app whenever you want. You can push it straight to the store. You can A-B test your app. You can set up a private beta. These are things you can't do on, on iOS. So I'm starting to see people really think about ways that maybe are more in a rapid iteration, thinking about adopting Android first. But to answer your core question of why maybe in the Bay Area that happens, I think we all gravitate to problems we have and, to, and, and to the things that we use, right? And so uh, iPhone is a great consumer product. It's, it's, it's one of the best consumer products ever made, I think. And I love using an iPhone. Um, and so it's very natural from there to make the leap if you're an engineer, if you're a product designer, if you're a marketer, to think about things of how you can make the iPhone experience better and let that set your framing in your mind as opposed to thinking about, again, 
that broader thing of how do I build a phone experience? How do I build a killer phone experience? All right, how about another question from someone who's working on mobile, either platform or any other? Great, I'll come over. Hi, my name is Jessica. I've launched my app on iOS and it's been around for a year and I'm transitioning to Android and I find that kind of accommodating all the screen sizes is really what many people don't, why they go to iOS. And I'm just wondering how, what, what ways to target certain screen sizes that you found work the best or which screen sizes to target. Yeah, so I think globally um, there's different uh, screen sizes that are in favor. And so what I would uh, recommend doing is I think the opportunity with Android is that it's got such a large user base. That doesn't mean you have to build from it for day one. Really what you still want to do is focus on building the right product experience and figuring out something that drives deep engagement, meaningful retention, um, and you know, proves out a theory on your business model, whether it's going to be an advertising supported business, a subscription business, an in-app purchasing business, whatever the business model is that's going to allow you to continue to invest. And so the way to do that is to constrain, right? You can limit what markets you launch in, you can limit what phones you support, you can limit what carriers you support, all that's possible on Android. And I think people just don't do that because naturally your instinct is like, well, it could work. You know, it's just code. It will kind of work. That can't be bad for me. But the reality is it's just code means uh, you don't actually know that the experience someone's going to get by just using your just code. And what you really need to be focused on is thinking about the experience and getting that experience nailed right. And you can do that by introducing constraints, including limiting the devices and screen sizes you support. How about one more question before I, I come back with mine? Anyone else? Yeah, right up there. I'll come to you. There we go. Just say your name. Buddy. Hey, I'm Tony. Uh, what tools and approaches do you recommend for A-B testing of Android apps in development? Yeah, so there's a bunch of uh, third-party tools that have launched to enable A-B testing. Um, I think the... And I haven't, to, to, be straight, to be direct, I haven't used any of them in an app, so I don't know what their specific pros and cons are, but I would definitely look at kind of the, the set of three to five that are out there. The, the, the approach, the methodology I would use, though, regardless of the tool and the infrastructure, is to um, focus on the number of experiments my team can run a week or a month. And as the manager or leader or founder, I'd be less focused on what experiment should we be running. I'd be more focused on increasing the velocity of experiments and making sure the organization knows, hey, I don't know how to do two experiments instead of one this week, but that's what I care about, not which experiment do we run. And to me, that's the real power and, and trick to building an A-B testing culture and approach that works, where it's, as a leader, you're not worried about the exact test and you trust the team will come up with the best tests uh, in the best order to do them, but you're focused on making sure that before arguments or feature design or feature build out takes uh, years or months or even weeks, you have really quick, small hypotheses that you're able to test. Uh, let's grab a seat to finish things up. One of the things that I want to help everyone out here do is get to know you. Not just hear you here, but start talking to you. What's a good way for people over the next few hours of the conference to get to know you? Um, so I'm going to be hanging out for the next hour or so. So just come up and introduce yourself. Just walk over. And walk over. Um, I'm on Twitter at Bubba M, B-U-B-B-A-M. Just shout out at me there. I'm pretty good at react, uh, following up. And if you're less of a Twitter public person, send me an email, Bubba at DFJ.com. Uh, I try my best to respond to everything. Sometimes it takes me a little while, but... Bubba at dfj.com. What's a good way to get your attention if we're sending you email and we know you're getting flooded? In the subject line, put why you're going to change mobile. With why the, you're going to change mobile. Yep. Like, what is your company going to do? What is your idea going to do that completely disrupts and changes the game in mobile? Let me put this crazy idea out there. You tell me if it makes any sense. You're married? There you go. Yes. That's not the crazy idea. Crazy idea is this. Last Darn, time we... I thought I was getting asked. No. <laughs> Will you marry me? <laughs> no. Crazy idea is this. I saw Dale Ressi last night at the party with a drink in his hand and a phone showing his wife himself on stage. And not just one, but he showed multiple pictures that others in the audience took of him and video that they took of him. And he said, look, look at what this guy took, look at what this guy took. I wonder if it makes sense for people here to take photos of you and put it on Twitter as a way of getting your attention. And maybe tonight when you go back and tell your wife about the day, you can show her your pictures and she'll see who took the photo. Is that, what do you think of that as a way of just touching in with you again? Yeah, that's a great idea. I have, uh, someone tweeted a picture of me on stage uh, from Monday, and I definitely showed it to my wife and got attention. I'd never really thought right. about systemizing that. That's great. <laughs> you should be in mobile marketing, Andrew. 
I should, I, or I should just be in the pushy business of pushing my audience into your life as a way of uh, helping them out. Hey, that's value creation. Uh, it is. Here, let me close it out with one other thing. We're talking a lot when we talk about mobile, about phones. What do you think, though, about this other mobile device that I've had here up on stage? Should we focus more on this or phones? So I think they're two different classes. So I think it's a misnomer to consider everything a tablet and a phone mobile. There is this weird class of devices, the phablet um, here, which um, I'm still forming my opinion on. This is the first phablet I've uh, carried as my main phone. But the core uh, tablet use case is often a lean back experience. It's often a you know, multiple hours with it in your lap while you're doing something else, oftentimes in the evening. If you look at web traffic by device type, you'll see very different curves for mobile, for mobile phones versus tablets. And I think that infers, uh, and, 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 um, infers as well as instigates kind of the, the thinking process of what are the two different use cases, right? You're using, I'd argue, your tablet a little bit like many people would use their phones. Hey, here's some notes. I'm holding it in my hand. I'm jogging it. Um, so that, but I don't know if that's the most common use case, right? Is the most common use case about sitting back um, and maybe doing something while you're watching television on it? Is it web browsing? Thinking about the use cases, and one of the big use cases on tablet uh, that I think probably is more important to solve than it is on the phone is how do you create complex content when at some point a touch interface on a tablet is the only input methods you have? You're not going to have a computer. So maybe you can't do Photoshop, but is there a set of photo things that you would think would be really popular and interesting for someone to do um, or for your user base to do? So those are the kinds of things where I think uh, of them very differently. We, we unfortunately call them one thing because they all run more or less the, the same two operating systems. But I think that'll continue to change and they'll continue to differentiate. All right. Uh, before I say goodbye to everyone, this post that you wrote, nine ways a billion dollar new mobile company can be created. Great post for people to get to read if they want to connect with you. True? True. Great also read post. the one I published on Monday, the mobile SDK crunch. So if you're building mobile apps, I'd love to get your data on how many SDKs are in your app and is it causing you business, product, or technical challenges to manage all those SDKs. My theory is it is. All right. My goal, as I've said, is to get these people to connect with you as much as possible. What's a good way for them to have a conversation right now as soon as you walk off the stage without overwhelming you? Um, nothing. I'm just going to stand right, I'll stand in the back so I don't interrupt and I'll be hanging out. I'm pretty comfortable with people. All right. Bubba, give him a big round of applause. Thank you, Bubba.